My name is Jonathan Goforth with Keller Williams Platinum Partners. I'm licensed in Missouri and Kansas, and I have my broker's license in Missouri. I've been a full-time realtor for 25 years, and I say all that to keep the real estate commissions happy. That sounds like it could be a test question, doesn't it? <laughs> Speaking of test questions, you are practicing to go pass the real estate exam. So please give this video a like and subscribe. I'm going to tell you why you should subscribe later. And let's jump right in quickly with number one. The rights to minerals laying beneath the surface of land. Number one, they stay with the seller unless otherwise uh, specified. Number two, they transfer with the sale of the real property. Number three, they stay public with the county. Number four, they reside with the EPA to determine at their discretion. So read that question again. The rights to minerals laying beneath the surface of land. So the answer to this involves vocabulary. So you have material that you are studying, hopefully, and a lot of that has vocabulary terms in it. And as you study, you probably are feeling pretty good, pretty comfortable with a variety of vocabulary terms. These test questions that I'm using are all coming to you thanks to people who have recently taken the real estate exam. And so this is a very good selection of things you should be studying for. And now we're going to uh, test you on... Um, helping you learn with vocabulary terms. And so your answer to this is number two. The rights to minerals laying beneath the surface of land transfer with the sale of the real property. These are called appurtenances. So read down there at the bottom with me below. Appurtenances run with the land. Therefore, they automatically transfer with the sale. Appurtenances include things such as minerals, covenants, and easements. So this is something you need to memorize. You're going to get thrown a variety of different questions and different formats using the term appurtenances. In this case, the uh, mineral rights are what's the feature of this question. Mineral rights automatically transfer. Every appurtenance automatically transfers with the sale of the real property. So that's why your answer is number uh, two. Question number two. A regulation with the purpose of giving all legal individuals an equal opportunity to apply for a loan is one, the Fair Housing Act. Number two, the CCA, that stands for the Credit Consumer Act. Number three, the ECOA, which stands for the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Number four, the Riparian Rights Act. So when you look at that, so let's read the question again. A regulation with the purpose of giving all legal individuals an equal opportunity to apply for a loan is, now look at those four choices. Number four, the Riparian Rights Act. Riparian is dealing with water. So it's not that. You can just knock that one out. The answer is number three, the ECOA, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. You need to know this. And so let's look at this slide. I want you to look at what the Equal Credit Opportunity Act is. You may see it abbreviated just ECOA. So you need to know ECOA is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. In case they don't spell the whole thing out for you, memorize that, what ECOA stands for. It is a regulation with the purpose of giving all legal individuals an equal opportunity to apply for loans. The act prohibits creditors and lenders from using someone's race, color, national origin, sex, religion, or marital status in deciding whether to approve their credit application. And that's something right there. I would screenshot that. So speaking of that, if there's something on here that you feel like you want to screenshot, you have my permission. I am here to help you. I'm not selling you anything at all. I enjoy teaching. And so screenshot them. There's going to be more coming up on this video. You need to screenshot. So you don't have to go back and watch the video over and over and try to remember 
Oh my gosh, I can't remember what question that was. Just screenshot them so you can go back and review them quickly later. Number three, which of the following is a common example of real estate police power? So what is police power? So police power is the government's right to change regulations and make laws for the general welfare of the public. That's what police power is. You need to know that. It's not on here written, but you just memorize. Police power is the government's right to change regulations and make laws for the general welfare of the public. Now, with that in mind, here's the question again. Which of the following is a common example of real estate police power? Number one, verifying real estate licenses through the real estate commissions, through the state commissions. Number two, issuing speeding tickets. Number three, issuing parking tickets. Or number four, zoning. And your answer is number four, zoning. Zoning is a common example of real estate police power. Number four, time, title, interest, and possession refers to which of these? Number one, squatter's rights. Number two, severalty. Number three, survivorship. Or number four, fair housing laws. Time, title, interest, and possession. So your answer is number three, survivorship. So these are characteristics of joint tenancy, which has the right of survivorship. For example, since I'm just teaching a little bit here, you have a husband and wife. They buy a house together. Along the way, one of them passes away. So one of them has died, and the remaining who is surviving, they take full ownership of the home because of joint tenancy. And so time, title, interest, and possession refers to survivorship because those are characteristics of joint tenancy. Now, here's why you should subscribe. So click the word subscribe, turn on your bell icon next to it so you're notified of future videos. So you're not going to be studying for this real estate exam very long. You're going to pass you need to cram as much as you can, read all your um, material, study everything you can, and then practice lots and lots of test questions. You, that's where you're really going to learn and where you're going to do well on the exam because the exam is in the format of these kinds of test questions. And so it's the best way to learn from, give you confidence, give you practice in seeing these questions in a lot of different ways. So when you get to the exam, um, you get... Um, to go through them quickly. You have confidence in taking the exam. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you some test-taking skills that are, in a way, almost important, almost as and more important than all the studying because all the material that you are learning, I've heard that you can pull way more than 10,000 different questions out of all that. That's the database of what real estate commissions are pulling from. And so... In this, once you pass the exam, you mail off your application and your fee to the state. You get your real estate license. Then come back to my real estate channel because everything else on my real estate channel is how to help you make a lot of money in real estate, how to be a successful realtor. I just did a, a video you will love how to make a million dollars a year in real estate. Uh, I don't say this to brag because I've been doing this 25 years. Um, my team and I, there's 12 of us on my team. We were paid over a million dollars last year in real estate. Um, my goal is to do that again this year. Uh, the last three years, I've been honored to be listed in Forbes magazine as one of the top market leaders in real estate in the country. So that's huge for me. And so thanks for watching this video. Again, please give it a like. Please subscribe. And let's move on. So these questions are really good ones to study for the exam. So I want you to probably be screenshotting these that are coming up now. There's a good chance you're going to see some of these. There's one question coming up. <laughs> it's very likely you're going to see it on the exam in one format or another. Number five, 
What do easements and liens have in common? Number one, they are both encumbrances. Number two, they both must have the permission by the homeowner to be filed. Number three, both of these are money claims against the title of the property. Number four, neither of them affect the sale of the property. So let's look at this a little bit. You do need to know this. Basically what we have in here are two vocabulary words, easements and liens. You need to know what they have in common. So this is why you might think you have these really memorized in your material. Now we're gonna just take it and expand it in a typical kind of test question that, you know, to be honest, it's designed to kind of trick you up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> that's kinda how these exams work. Um, let's look at number two. Would that be an option? They both must have the permission by the homeowner to be filed. That would not be true because liens can come as voluntary or involuntary. Some liens, the homeowner does not give permission to be filed and they're filed against them anyway. Um, they are not uh, money claims. Easements are not money claims. Both of these are money claims against the title on number three. Yeah, easements are not. Liens uh, are, easements are not. Number four, neither of them affect the sale of the property. Well, liens do for sure. Easements um, pass along because those are appurtenances. So let's look at the answer. Your answer is number one. They are both encumbrances. And so you, this is what an encumbrance is. Uh, read along with me at the bottom. Liens can be voluntary, such as taking a mortgage, or involuntary, such as a lien for not paying a bill, like tax liens or contractor liens for failing to pay. Many homes have easements, such as utility easements, but they are not money claims or judgments. Both can affect the sale of property because liens have to be paid or released. And sometimes there are easement problems, but both of these are encumbrances. That's what they have in common. They're both encumbrances. Number six, the best way to determine fair value. This will come up throughout your career. Now, I'll be honest, a lot of the things that you're studying, like encumbrances, appurtenances, you're never gonna use those terms on a day-to-day -day basis. I've never used those terms in 25 years of selling homes. But number six has come up during my career. So again, the best way to determine fair value is number one, by determining the replacement cost. Number two, by using a GRM, a gross rent multiplier. Number three, by using an appraisal. Number four, by determining what the seller paid for it and then adding 5% for each year the seller has owned it. So your answer is number three. It's by using an appraisal. That is the best way to determine fair value. An example of this, we go on listing appointments and we give pricing opinions. We are not doing an appraisal. We're just giving an opinion of value. So for example, here's something that I've had throughout my 25 years on and off, a friend of mine, let's say they get a divorce and during the divorce, they have to have a fair market value of their home to determine if one of them's gonna buy the other one out what the house is worth if it has to come on the market and be sold. They have to know this uh, during their divorce process. And so, well, Jonathan, he's a realtor. He can come over. He'll give us fair value. Well, when that happens, here's what's going to happen. If I go over there and I do that, I'm going to make one of them mad. I'm going to come in a little bit high and one of them is mad because they've got to pay the other one out on a value that was really too high. Or I come in too low, and now the other one's mad. And so it puts me in a really bad situation. And what I tell them is I am not the best way to determine fair, fair value. An appraiser is. They need to spend the money, hire an appraisal 
to be done on that house because number three on there, using an appraisal, that is the best way to determine fair value. Folks, I, you're going to probably see a question like this on your exam. You need to screenshot this one. Make sure you know that. Number seven, the biggest cause of loss of value in real property is due to one, the damage from years of wear and tear. Number two, deferred maintenance. Number three, age. Number four, obsolescence. All four of those are good answers. They are. All four of those cause loss of value, right? This is where it's tricky because you read that and you're like, ugh, I don't think I can even eliminate one. They're all good answers. But look at the question. The question says the biggest cause. What is the biggest cause of loss of value? Your answer is number four obsolescence. So obsolescence can refer to economic obsolescence or functional obsolescence. It means to no longer be useful. It's obsolete and it creates the biggest loss of value in real estate. That is another good one. You really need to know that. You may see that worded in a different way. You might see it worded very similar to this. The biggest cause, and that's another reason I'm going to explain, you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple pieces of advice now. This is another reason to subscribe because I have stuff like this on my channel of advice. When you go in and you take the real estate exam, um, couple. here's what I did. When I took my broker exam last year, you know, I'm older now. I've been doing this 25 years. I, I'm 54. When you're a little older and you go into an exam like this, it's hard. Uh, it's not that the material is all that horrible. Um, I mean, it is if you haven't studied for it. But sitting still for that long of a period, reading a computer screen without being filled with anxiety, that's, that's the tough part. So a couple things I want you to do when you go in and you take this exam. Um, this is going to help you pass. So when you go into the exam center, you're going to be given a sheet of paper and a calculator. The sheet of paper is scratch paper. It's there for you to do math questions. By the way, I have other videos, lots of other videos on test questions. After you're done with this, check out the other videos. I've got math questions. Yes, you will have some math questions. Um, that's why I have these math videos also. But take your scratch paper. Here's what I do. Let's say question number four on your exam. You don't know the answer. You're guessing. First thing I want to advise you with, pick an answer. Before you move on, pick an answer. Whatever you think is best, and then write down that question number on that sheet of paper. You know, I want you to start making a list of question numbers that you are totally guessing on. And then along the way, question 11. You have no clue. You've never even heard of what they're asking about, and so you're gonna guess. Well, pick an answer. You've got to pick an answer um, in case you run out of time. I mean, if you pick them all randomly good enough, you still pass. Um, write down that question number. Then by the time you make it to the end of the exam, you should have a little bit of time left over. Then go back and look at those questions numbers you wrote down. Because now that the exam's over, it might um, make you think during the exam, you know what? I think I remember the answer to number four now. I know it. Well, you need to make sure that you wrote down those question numbers so you can just go back to your list of questions you were guessing on, and it will also give you confidence. You know, by the time you make it to the end of the exam, you may have not very many on there that you guessed, and it has probably just crossed your mind. You know what? I think I've already passed. I think if all the others are correct, I didn't guess on enough to actually fail the exam. And it could give you a lot of confidence. And then you may go back and look at those that you guessed at. And now you may get two or three of those correct by uh, going back and looking at them again. Let's go to the next question. Number eight, the agency that enforces all federal environmental rules and regulations is one, the SDWA, number two, Sarah, 
S-A-R-A. Number three, the EPA. Number four, CERCLA, the C-E-R-C-L-A. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the easier ones. Um, but it's on here because somebody recently mentioned they saw this type of question on their exam. So I put it on this video to be included. Your answer is three, EPA. I want you to just memorize it, screenshot it. The EPA stands for the Environmental Protection Agency. It's the federal agency that deals with environmental issues. And that's your answer. Number nine, as we do this question, <laughs> if you would screenshot this one when I give you the answer, give this one, this is the reason, if you haven't liked my video yet, here's the reason to like this video. I'm gonna get you a point on your exam Probably, if you see this question on this number nine, the Federal National Mortgage Association stands for FNMA. We pronounce FNMA Fannie Mae. That's the nickname we give FNMA. So the Federal National Mortgage Association is, number one, a federal agency that buys FHA and VA loans. Number two, a federal agency which acts as a watchdog on the primary mortgage market. Number three, a government-sponsored private corporation designed to assist the primary mortgage market. Number four, a federal agency that insures all types of mortgage loans. We're going to talk about this for a moment because uh, if you see this, I want to make sure you get this one right. Number one looks like it could be the answer, but your answer is number three. I'm gonna tell you why. We're gonna take just a moment because I've been doing this a long time. I know what Fannie Mae is, but if you are just now studying for real estate and you're going through all this information and it's, it's overwhelming, I mean, you're studying for a very large test. The exam covers a lot of different information, you know, residential and commercial, you're having to learn a lot of stuff all at the same time. You may have always heard of Fannie Mae, but you never really knew what it was. So let's talk about what Fannie Mae is. Fannie Mae is number three. That's your answer. It is a government-sponsored private corporation designed to assist the primary mortgage market. So what does Fannie Mae do? Well, Fannie Mae, in some ways, is number one on there. It buys loans. It buys all loans. It's the purpose of Fannie Mae. So it's, as you can see on number three, it's a government-sponsored private corporation. It is not a federal agency. That's the big thing I want you to remember. It is not a federal agency. It looks like it would be. When you read up there the title of it, the Federal National Mortgage Association looks like a federal agency. It's not. And that's why so many people will miss that question. It is a government-sponsored private corporation. It's private. So Congress passed a charter to allow this a long time ago, a long, long time ago. Fannie Mae's been around forever. And its purpose is to buy loans. It frees up the liquidity of banks, especially small banks uh, and credit unions. Those banks run out of their money quickly. And so they sell their loans to Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae buys all those loans. It frees up all the bank's liquidity and the bank can do it over and over and over and over and over. It encourages home ownership. That's the purpose of Fannie Mae. That's what the Federal National Mortgage Association is. And I want you to screenshot it, memorize it, and please give this video a like. That one right there is enough to get you a point. Number 10, which of the following would be classified as a general lien? So you can have specific liens, you can have general liens. So again, which of the following would be classified as a general lien? Yes, you're probably going to need to know this. Um, and so that's why this question's on here is for you. Let's look at number one, a judgment lien. Number two, a property tax lien. 
Or number three, a real estate property tax lien. Number four, a mechanics lien. So here's all the answers I want, I want to, you to learn from this because you can see this question in different ways. So let's help you no matter what way your state might give you this question. Let's give you some confidence in how you can answer it. Your answer is number one, a judgment lien. So here's the description of each one. A judgment lien, this is placed on all the assets of the debtor in general. It's a general lien. It's placed on all the different assets. Number two and number three are about the same. A property tax lien is a specifically placed lien on the property that's delinquent in the taxes. Just like number three, a real estate property tax lien is also placed on the property that's delinquent in the taxes. It's specific. It can only be placed against the property that's delinquent in the taxes. That lien cannot be a general lien over all the assets of the debtor, only against that property. And it's just like number four, a mechanics lien is also specifically placed on a property where the work was done, but not paid for. And so I want you to remember a judgment lien. Just remember a judgment lien is a general lien. It's placed on all of the different assets of the debtor in general. I'm gonna do five more questions. We're gonna go through these pretty quick. So screenshot these answers. That way you can refer back to them and kind of just review before your exam. These five questions are commonly on real estate exams. They're also commonly missed. So that's they, these next five questions I'm putting here on purpose to help you pass so you study efficiently. Number 11, a balloon payment is commonly associated with Number one, a loan issued by a credit union. Number two, a blanket mortgage. Number three, a large payment during or at the end of the term. Or number four, an adjustable rate mortgage that must be paid when the arm expires. And so the answer to this, a balloon payment is commonly associated with number three. It's a large payment during or at the end of the term. For example, a construction loan is a good example of, of a type of loan that would have a balloon payment. Uh, a balloon type of situation is typically a short-term loan, uh, maybe a six-month loan. And at the end of that, all the principals do. Some commercial loans have balloons in them. But that's what it is. It is not number four, and that's commonly picked. Some people think, oh, it's an adjustable rate mortgage. You got to pay the thing off when the arm expires. And that's a wrong answer. Your correct answer on that is number three. What are three types of business structures? This question is a little bit harder. Uh, let's do number one, FNMA, EPA, and a corporation. Of course, you know FNMA is Fannie Mae. And we've had another one. You know the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. Number two, a corporation, a sole proprietorship, and a limited liability company. That is an LLC. Number three, a corporation, and a joint corporation, and a large corporation. And number four, a general partnership, a sole proprietorship, and a revocable trust. So what are three types of business structures? Your answer is number two, a corporation, a sole proprietorship, and a limited liability company. And so now I wanna show you the five most common types of business structures. These are the five most common types and I want you to just screenshot this. Just memorize this in case you get a question like this. You're not going to miss it. These are the five most common types of business structures. A corporation, a limited liability company, which is an LLC, a sole proprietorship, a general partnership, and a limited partnership. 
And that's just one. I just want you to memorize that. Be prepared for that in case you see a question like that. Number 13. This is another good one that real estate commissions enjoy uh, testing on. They enjoy talking about personal property and real property. And so number 13, personal property can be one, sold during an estate sale while the home is on the market. Two, alienated or hypothecated. Number three, turned into real property. Or number four, all of the above. And so on this, your answer is number four, all of the above. So let's talk about what these words are in case you were just kind of thrown a little bit on what are some of these words? Well, number one, um, so personal property, yes, it can be sold during an estate sale while a home is on the market. That will happen to you many times on your listings. Um, it's just personal property. Homeowner has the right to take it with them or sell it. Number two, personal property can be alienated or hypothecated. Alienated is to get rid of it. Uh, a trash dumpster <laughs> parked on the driveway is a good way to annihilate all of the personal property inside the home. They're going to get rid of it. Or uh, hypothecated is to use the personal property as collateral to obtain a loan. Number three you can turn it into real property. An example of taking personal property and doing this is say you buy a ceiling fan and then install it in a bedroom and that makes it a fixture. And now since it's attached as a fixture, it would stay with the home. You turn personal property into real property. And so that makes your answer number four, all of the above. Number 14, what is the sudden removal of land? So this is coming from four different vocabulary words. So I'm going to help you learn these four words in case you see any of these four words used in a variety of other questions. This one question could be used in a multiple different ways on your exam. So what is the sudden removal of land? Number one, erosion. Number two, accretion. Number three, avulsion. Number four, encumbrance. So what do you think on this one? Many people get it wrong and they pick number one. They pick erosion because it sounds great. It's the sudden removal of land, erosion. But that's wrong. It is not number one. Your answer is number three, avulsion. So let's talk about what these words are. Erosion is the gradual wearing away of land. Erosion is slow. It's not sudden. So look at the question up there. What is the sudden removal of land? Uh, number two, accretion. That is the gradual building up of land. Uh, for example, uh, the end of a river, let's say the bottom of the Mississippi River, and it's bringing all the sediment down, and so you see the land uh, slowly, gradually building up the huge delta at the bottom of the river. Avulsion is your answer, and avulsion is the sudden removal. It's the sudden removal of land. An example would be hurricane destruction of a hillside uh, washing it into the ocean. Sometimes in California, when you see a very heavy rain day after day, and you see these beautiful multi-million dollar homes up on these cliffs and the dirt washes out from under them. And in 10 minutes, the hillside collapses out from under the house and you watch it slip into the ocean. That is avulsion. Uh, earlier on this video, we've talked about encumbrances. And what is an encumbrance? This is a good review in case for all of us with short-term memory, an encumbrance is a claim against a property by someone other than the owner. An example is an easement or a lien. You remember this now from earlier on this video. Uh, number 15, we're gonna talk about this one. Real estate commissions love to test 
on antitrust laws. So that's why this question is on here for you. Let's read number 15. Regarding antitrust laws, which action can be legally performed by a licensed real estate agent? I'm going to just read it again. Regarding antitrust laws, which action can be legally performed by a licensed real estate agent? Number one, price fixing. Number two, dividing territories. Number three, selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. Number four, conspiracy to boycott. This is a very important question. I'm going to tell you what these answers, uh, what these different choices mean, because you will likely see an antitrust question on your exam. Now, what's funny, the, the exams, they're a little bit different around the country. Uh, typically, you're going to see an exam of 70 questions, 75 questions, 80 to 90 questions is a typical real estate exam for this portion of the questions. You know, you're going to have a state portion. You're going to have a national portion. You got two sections, completely separate sections of the exam. You have to pass both sections. And um, let's talk about these answers. Your, your correct answer is number three. So let's read the question again. Regarding antitrust laws, which action can be legally performed by a licensed real estate agent? Number three, selling a property you have listed to a buyer who lives in a different state. Absolutely, you can do that. But for some reason, a lot of people don't pick the correct answer on this. You know, if you're in Florida, you do this all the time. People are buying condos. Uh, vacation homes, second homes, third homes. They're used to people out of state buying properties there. But for most of the country, we're not really used to this, although it's become a lot more popular with people buying um, homes to do VRBO. You got Verbos going on, um, all kinds of other investment properties from people buying from one state to another. But I think the confusion is when they read a question like this, they think they have to be licensed in the other state. And so I'm going to give you a, a test-taking tip that I think might help with this. Um, a lot of people pick number two. So let's talk about price fixing is illegal. You cannot do price fixing. Uh, dividing territories is also illegal. These violate the antitrust laws. So what is dividing territories? This is where I think why a lot of agents pick that as the answer is because let's say you live in a large city, you have a huge metropolitan area, and you're not going to sell in the whole city. Uh, let's say you're not going to sell north of the river. It's just, it's too far away. You don't even go up there. Um, you're not familiar with those areas. If you had clients that wanted to live north of the river, you're going to refer those to another agent. Unless it's a million dollar house and then you'd probably do it. <laughs> and you might think, oh, that must be what that is. So yeah, dividing territories, that's totally fine. But that's not what this is. Dividing territories is when a broker gets together with another broker, two separate brokerages, and they get together and they kind of put together a little agreement uh, I'm going to have my agent sell north of the river and you have your agent sell south of the river and we're going to divide the territory so we don't compete against each other so much. And that violates antitrust laws. So number two is illegal. And then, of course, you could probably guess conspiracy to boycott. Certainly can't do that. That's also a violation of antitrust laws. So your answer is number three, yes, you can sell properties you have listed to buyers who live in different states. Um, so thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Please give this video a like. I want to share with you a test-taking tip. This is what I did. I haven't shared this much on other videos, but it helps me a lot. So in addition to making a list of questions you're guessing at, writing those numbers down as you go throughout the exam so you can come back to those at the end 
if you have enough left over time. Um, something I do, and I think it gets worse as I get older. I, I, uh, I did do this when I took my broker's exam last year. Uh, I use my, and I read like this too, because my eyes, as they get tired, my eyes start to jerk around the page and I have trouble focusing. Then I start getting frazzled. So what I do, I am right-handed. I use my right hand on the mouse for all my clicking. You're, by the way, you're going to take this exam on a computer screen. And I use my left hand and I lean forward and I touch the screen and I drag my finger across these words so I don't skip words, I don't skip lines, I stay very focused in what I'm reading. Um, so I read the, the question fully all the way through and then I read my answers in order and I pick the correct answer. That's how I do it and I think this would help many people um, just to calm down a little bit, read the question all the way through, read your answers in order, you pick the correct one, and you click to the next one. It has helped me so much. And yes, I passed my exam the first time. I do very well on these exams. I, I know this material very, very well. I love real estate. I, I, it's fascinating. But even if you go into this situation and you know the information very well, this comes down to good test-taking tips. There are strategies in how you take these exams. And that's something that helps me a lot. And as you get tired, you've been sitting there for over an hour, you're getting exhausted from it. Um, this can help. Uh, something else that helped me, who would have thought, I, I do not wear earplugs ever. But when I went in to my broker's exam, um, and I'll tell you, if you're studying to take the broker's exam, you are, you've already been a, a real estate agent for a while. The broker's exam is very similar. It's pretty much, for the most part, the same kind of questions. Um, in many ways, it is the same questions. But you have to have a higher score to pass the broker's exam. That's what makes it harder. Uh, so if you think it's hard enough <laughs> getting the salesperson exam passed, try doing it with a higher passing score for the broker exam. So I went in, I'm sitting there. In case you don't know what it's like, it's probably a long galley looking hallway type of room, a narrow room. And um, you're gonna see computers uh, lined facing both sides of the wall. So there's kind of a, a pathway going down the, the room. This is how ours is. And you're kind of back to back, you know, with other people taking the exam. And, but there's enough space between that people can get up and go take a break, go to the bathroom. For some reason, when I sat down and I started taking my exam, I've been in it for my 10 minutes. And the woman behind me, she's also taking an exam. She starts sighing. Every question, I hear her sigh. It's this loud, heavy breathe, breathing, moaning, and it stressed me out. Well, they had earplugs sitting there at the computer. I put them in. At first, I didn't. I never wear earplugs. But after a while, I mean, this woman, I just want to turn around and just say, would you shut up? So <laughs> instead, <laughs> I put in the earplugs. It helped me concentrate. I got through the exam great. I passed it. And it's over. So after you pass your exam, and you will, then come back and look at all my other videos that help you make a lot of money. That's the whole purpose about being in real estate. It's the most awesome career, unlimited income potential. Uh, and it's fun. The more houses you sell, the more money you make, but you're helping people. And... Um, there's nothing better than feeling good about helping other people find their dream home, whether that's their very first house, whether it's a, a an investment property. Whatever it is, you truly are helping people accumulate wealth long-term through home ownership and investing in real estate. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe, give it a like. You guys know the drill. And check out my other test question videos next. So you are thoroughly prepared before you go take the exam. Thanks.